Charles Darwin's Origin of Species. It is a fundamental reason why many become atheists in the first place. When did you first become an atheist? And I think I became an atheist properly at the age of about 16 or 15. And what was it? I suppose it was really understanding Darwin. For a century and a half, Darwinism has been atheism's trump card. But today, even its strongest tenet is under threat. How long do you think it'll take before Darwin is actually comprehensively rewritten? and it is accepted as such? That's an interesting question. I could be rather rapidly. All major religions have insisted that man occupies a special place in God's realm. Darwin changed all that. He put mankind back into nature, a creature different from the beasts of the field, only through a complex, natural process. He was taking on the religious establishment and inadvertently giving atheism its first sacred text. The importance of Darwin to atheists cannot be overstated. Steve Fuller, a philosopher of science from Warwick University, believes Darwin lies at the centre of modern atheist thought. Well, if you uh, ask about the relationship between uh, Darwinism and atheism, uh, I think it's a very clear connection, especially if we think about atheism as a, as a view that's against any kind of uh, belief in a supernatural personal deity that's involved with sort of planning uh, a created universe. Darwinism uh, clearly denies that. It's not clear, uh, at least to my mind, on what other basis especially scientifically credible bases, one could have uh, for atheism. This is, it seems to be a scientific theory being expanded way, way beyond its acceptable intended limits. Darwinism here is not simply a philosophy of the emergence of biological species, but rather a way of understanding everything. Darwinism is universal. That's a very interesting position. It's one that I personally have some difficulty with because I certainly do not see the, the Darwinian paradigm operating, for example, in the history of ideas. Day by day, the limits of Darwinism are becoming increasingly clear. Atheists hold on to the central idea of Darwinist evolution with quasi-religious fervor. But the fact is that the theory is getting on a bit. It's now 147 years old. And as with religion's ancient texts, many of today's scientists are finding holes in it. This is the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Its fossil collection is seen by some scientists as challenging Darwin's theory of evolution. And Professor Jeffrey Schwartz is a scientist who is turning Darwinism on its head. You might think he's a member of the evangelical religious right, but he's actually an agnostic. Here we see, um... Schwartz says the fossil record suggests that species can appear suddenly. What's interesting is that if we look at this specimen here, this is actually a cast of the most famous specimen, the first specimen of Archaeopteryx. Yes. And this has some features of dinosaur kind of things, if you will. Uh, it has tooth jaws. You can't see it in here. It still had teeth. You can see the feathers. So Darwin used Archaeopteryx as an example of an intermediate, something that's between reptiles and birds. Others said, no, this is just there, you know, popped out of nowhere. So the thing is that intermediate is really in the eye of the beholder. And um, Schwartz uses a modern understanding of genes to explain how new features, or novelties, appear suddenly as opposed to through gradual evolution. The theory that I, I proposed is that um, a so-called mutation in the broadest sense arises usually in the unexpressed or recessive state. And in modern biology, biological language, we would say inactive. Spreads silently through the population until you have individuals with a copy of this novel potential for novelty. And then they produce offspring that has both copies 
boom, you get it. You get it. So Within one generation. Yes. The spread of the potential for novelty may take several generations. The appearance of the novelty is like that. An hour from West Virginia. The dramatic point about the good professor's theory is that Darwin can only explain how novelty evolves, not where it originates from. The same applies to entire species. You could rewrite Darwin's most famous work on the origin of adaptation by means of natural selection. The Darwinian theory is that selection causes the feature to appear. But in fact, a feature w can only have selection act on it once it appears. How long do you think it'll take before uh, Darwin is actually comprehensively rewritten and it is accepted as such? That's an interesting question. I could be rather rapidly. But the past has shown that the tools of the scientific method, logic, reason and evidence, don't always lead to a better world. In 1865, Darwin's half-cousin, Francis Galton, took the logical step and applied Darwin's theory of natural selection to human beings. Using logic and reason, Galton came up with a theory called eugenics, and the results were a bit worrying. Galton's career is unimaginable without Darwin's work for seeing it. He's directly inspired by the origin of species, and he's directly inspired because Darwin clearly implies that the theory applies to humans as much as it does to the animal and plant kingdom. And the problem is this, is that although evolution proceeds by natural selection, Civilized society, civilization, negates natural selection. So Darwin says... How we, does it? Well, the, the sick, the, the lame, uh, the feeble-minded, says Darwin, are protecting civilized society. And so Galton and eugenics is the solution to that, if you like. It's saying... Which is not to care about them. Not necessarily not to care about them, but certainly to restrict their breeding. Because otherwise, and Darwin explicitly recognises this in the descent of man, there's a danger that we unfit will outbreed the fit. And natural selection and the evolutionary process will go into reverse. Golden tried to develop scientific techniques to identify the unwanted in society by their physical traits. What he did is he went around collecting photographs of various types of criminals in the hope of being able to discover common physical traits between them. And what, what are these photographs of? These are of various different categories of criminals. Of criminal? He did this for racial groups as well. In, in 1885, he does a study of Jewish boys. One chap who found such ideas particularly compelling was Adolf Hitler. David Stack runs a course called From Darwin to Death Camps. He believes the Nazis took Galton's ideas one step further, using them to justify the extermination of Jews. Is there a direct line between Darwin, Galton and Hitler? There's a direct line. Is Darwin responsible for what happens under the Nazis? No. Is there an intellectual connection? Then yes. Darwin removes the spirituality of mankind. He places man within nature. Once you do that, then you can begin to regard man as, as you regard animals and as you regard the plant kingdom. You'll find very few good-minded liberal atheists arguing the case for eugenics these days. Why not? What's the matter, boys? Scientifically, it is, after all, very difficult to argue against. But something stops us clamouring for the compulsory sterilisation of mentally handicapped people. Something perhaps unscientific. That something is called morality. The fact that atheists have to confront is a terrible one. The scientific method is, by definition, supposedly disinterested and neutral. So, if you rely on science to tell you how to live your life, where do you look for moral guidance?